My friends, they all told me, man, there's something gonna change your life. My friends, they all told me, man, there's something gonna change your life. Cause I had that brown sugar Man, it's just gonna change my life Man, I got to have that brown sugar Man, it's just gonna make me feel so right I should say in the last unit we started talking about local exhaust ventilation um, we're also going to be talking about local exhaust ventilation in this unit uh, if you remember last time I said we're going to break local exhaust ventilation down into two separate units because there's so much information it's a very dense topic by dense I mean there's a lot of information uh, that I want you to be familiar with when you leave the class a lot of this information um, does show up on certification exams um, so it's now it's on a day-to-day -day basis it's probably not information you will use unless you're working directly with the design or maintenance of a of a local exhaust ventilation system but it's 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 still important information for a safety professional to be familiar with um, yeah, th this is one of those topics that separates a safety professional from what I would call a safety technician level person. You know, the safety professional is going to know a lot about a lot, or know at least a little about a lot of things, I should say. Um, in the last unit, uh, we started talking again about local exhaust ventilation systems. This is a diagram that we have here that illustrates the main components. So in the last, uh, the last unit we talked about the hood component and this is after i introduced you to the you know to what local exhaust ventilation was all about you know local exhaust ventilation is is uh is a system to remove contaminated air and replacing that contaminated air with clean air and it's several components as we see here uh, the hood which we talked about there are different hood designs uh, we talked about the duct work and some of the information, some of the relevant information about ductwork. And we talked about air treatment systems that are not necessary in all systems, but uh, in some systems it is, some systems it isn't necessary. Depends on the contaminant, the location of the facility, 
and some other variables uh, uh, will determine whether the an air treatment system is needed. And also uh, local regulations, local laws uh, may, de may determine, may require that an air treatment system be included in the local exhaust ventilation system. In this second unit, we are going to talk about fans. We are going to talk about the exhaust uh, system and some things we need to know about exhaust you may think well it's just that's where the air leaves well there are some considerations that need to be made uh, when it comes to designing a system with regard to the exhaust if the exhaust is not designed well it can affect the functioning of the system we're also going to talk about makeup air we're going to talk about testing a system then we're going to talk about uh, just very briefly designing a system you know what what would be involved if we end up being part of a design team. Uh, like I said in the last unit though, engineers who specialize in this, those are going to be the, the uh, uh, individuals have, who have the primary responsibility for designing the system, doing the calculations and so on. But as safety professionals, we could, we're still gonna be a part of that team if we end up in that situation. Uh, we're going to be a part of that team. We need to know this information so we can understand what the engineers are talking about. Uh, so but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to talk about fans first. Uh, the fan is the heart of the system. It's, it's what gets the air moving through the system. The fan uh, creates negative pressure. Uh, Airflow will move from positive pressure to negative pressure so that fan, the spinning blades or impellers of the fan create the negative pressure uh, which sucks air into the fan and then the fan is propelled in the form of positive pressure. The outlet side of the fan we're talking about positive pressure the inlet side of the fan, we're talking about negative pressure. And we do need to talk more about the pressure in the system because that's what, that's what it's all about with our ventilation system and, and proper functioning. Pressure differentials created by the fan get the air moving through the system. Uh, pressure can be measured in a variety of units, whether you're we're using the imper uh, imperial system of measurement or the metric system of measurement. Oftentimes you will see pressure uh, measured in what we call inches of water column or WC. Also you'll see, uh, see WG for water gauge which represents uh, the same as water column. Water column, water gauge, same thing but we're measuring pressure uh, using those units. Uh, the metric system, we would be measuring the pressure in terms of pascals. Uh, pascals or kilopascals, depending on, the, on the, the analysis, depending on the system. Uh, and here we go, inches of water columns also referred to as water gauge pressure, abbreviated WG or WC. Uh, there are three types of pressure that we need to be familiar with uh, when talking about ventilation systems. Static pressure, velocity pressure, also referred to as dynamic pressure, then the total system pressure or total pressure. And here is the basic simple formula representing how those are related. Total pressure equals static pressure plus velocity pressure. And you'll also see this same formula presented uh, with this notation. P sub T equals P sub S plus P sub V. This is the notation you're likely to see on certification exams. Uh, the, the formulas that are provided to you on certification exams will uh, use this notation on the top here. Let's talk a little bit more about static pressure and what static pressure is. It's the pressure exerted against the walls of the ductwork in your ventilation system. If a duct were blocked, the only type of pressure in that system would be static pressure. 
Static pressure can be negative or positive. On the inlet side, it's going to be negative. On the outlet side, it's going to be positive. What we have in the diagram here are the position of positioning of different measuring devices used to measure pressure. One of the devices that we use, which we'll talk more about, is called a pitot tube. If we're measuring static pressure, uh, the uh, pitot tube is going to be inserted in a variety of different positions. And this is probably something you'll never need to need to bother yourself with as a safety professional, unless you spe end up specializing, say, in ventilation systems. And maybe you end up specializing in uh, industrial hygiene with a subspecialty in industrial ventilation, then you're going to, to study this in more detail and you, you would be, become more familiar with the different instruments and the proper placements of those instruments within the uh, ventilation system. And these instruments are located within the ductwork of the systems to take the pressure measurements. Oh. What kind of pressure is being exerted against the, the walls of the hot air balloon from the inside? Static pressure. We got static pressure exerting uh, force against the walls of the balloon. It's not moving, it's not dynamic, it's just static in place. Velocity pressure is the pressure of air movement. It's the pressure exerted by the air as it moves through the system. Pressure of air moving through a duct. It is a function of the air velocity, the speed with which the air is moving through the duct work and the density of the air. And here's some other diagrams showing uh, the placement of pitot tubes within the duct work for taking different measurements. This, by the way, is from uh, the OSHA technical manual. Both of these diagrams that I've thrown at you here, these are from the OSHA technical manuals. Uh, total pressure is the, the sum of static pressure and velocity pressure. Pressure created by the flowing air and pressure against the duck wall. And over on the suction side, we see negative static pressure over on the outlet side or the pressure side, we have positive static pressure. Uh, velocity pressure uh, is the same on both sides, but the total pressure is going to be uh, different. Again, notice total pressure on the suction side is negative. We're creating that negative pressure to get the air sucked into the fan. So we've had negative total pressure, positive total pressure on the outlet side of the fan. And this diagram over here gives you a better uh, idea of the relationship between velocity pressure and static pressure. Again, static pressure is exerted in all directions against the walls of the ductwork, while velocity pressure is only exerted in the direction of the air movement within the system. And we have static, 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 and then we have velocity pressure in the direction of the airflow. And I do have a fly buzzing me, so I may need to stop at some point and kill the fly. Uh, see, see if he bothers me too much. He's on my tablet right now. But, but let's, let's try to continue on, though. Uh, now, when it comes to pressure and fans and uh, ventilation systems, there's more information in the calculations tutorial videos. I provide you with those videos. Uh, if you want to watch them, you can. If you're down the road looking at taking the ASP or the CSP exam, there could be good study resources for you. But for this class, you don't have to watch those videos. Uh, here is the formula, and this is a formula you might see on the CSP ASP exam. It's the formula for calculating the static pressure of a fan. The static pressure of a fan equals the static pressure on the outlet side minus the static pressure on the inlet side minus the velocity pressure on the inlet side. And again, pressure measurements are taken with uh, pitot tubes and man uh, a manometer, which we haven't talked about yet. We're going to talk more about the instruments before we're done here. I think you should know uh, 
have some basic knowledge about the different instruments that would be used and I'm going to focus on that before we're done with this unit. And they are inserted into the ductwork, these instruments. You have the pitot tube that's connected to the manometer. The manometer is actually going to give you the reading, the pressure reading. But uh, given this diagram here, we have our static pressure in, our velocity pressure in, and our static pressure out. What is the static pressure? The fan. Use this formula, plug in these values, and we find that the static pressure of the fan or at the fan is 2.7 inches water gauge using uh, that, uh, those units of measurement. Uh, there are several laws of fan behavior or basic fan laws. Uh, on the certification exams, and that's where this is going to be most relevant for you, uh, fan laws are a favorite on certification exams, but only th only a few of the fan laws. If I remember correctly, there are six or eight fan laws, but the fan laws that are focused or, or that can show up on the certification exams are the ones that I'm going to cover uh, coming up. Um, but the fan laws that we're going to talk about uh, deal with the relationship between RPMs or the fan revolutions per minute, the horsepower, the fan motor horsepower, and the static pressure created by the fan. Also, uh, airflow volume is, is an important variable in these uh, fan laws, and they are mathematically related. This is one of the fan law formulas here. Pressure and volume of air are related to the revolutions per minute of the fan. This is the volume of air cubic feet per minute is related to the revolutions per minute or the RPMs of the fan. And I've got videos on this that go into much more detail, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. And I, for this class, you don't need all that additional detail. But again, certification exams, you'll want to watch those videos to learn a little bit more about the relationship and uh, and uh, how to solve certain types of problems that you might see on certification exams. Now, real-world safety management, engineers are going to be doing all this. Uh, we're going to sit in uh, on a meeting with engineers, and they're going to do the math. But we need to, again, we need to know the basics uh, so that we are not completely lost as the engineers are working about uh, working out the design of the system. And here's the formula for the relationship between pressure and revolutions per minute. And this is volume of air in revolutions per minute. This is pressure. I don't need to write that again. And all of the, the, the units that I'm using for our discussion here are imperial units, cubic feet per minute. You could also end up working with metric units. The RPMs of the fan are also related to the horsepower of the fan motor. Horsepower, RPMs are related. Now, these are the most common forms. Back up here again. These are the most common forms of these formulas. If I can stay on this slide for a second. But these are some alternative forms uh, some alternative formulas that are really the same formula as we had on this slide, but just slightly reconfigured. The formulas have been transposed mathematically. Uh, and as I said uh, previously, there are other fan laws that look at the diameter of the impeller, the impeller velocity, and other fan-related variables. But as far as certification exams, uh, it's revolutions per minute, it's uh, cubic feet per minute or volume of air. It's horsepower of the fan motor and pressure. Those are the four main variables that you need to be familiar with for certification exams. And uh, if you do want to go ahead and take a look at the, at the calculations, at some calculations using those formulas, that video tutorial is available. I give you uh, probably four or five different examples of 
use you know, how we might need to use those fan laws uh, and how we may need to execute calculations using those fan laws on a certification exam. But let's talk about the two basic types of fans that you're likely to see in an industrial setting. The axial fan, and it's generating negative pressure as do all fans. Uh, the axial fan has blades that rotate around a center axis. And we see two examples of axial fans here. This is actually a duct booster fan. Uh, that's one thing we didn't talk about when we talked about the different components of a ventilation system. Um, some ventilation systems, they don't just have one fan. They also have fans that are located within the ductwork that help boost the airflow through the, through the system. And they're called duct booster fans. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about duct booster fans before we're done, but that's what we have here. Uh, this is a, a temporary uh, axial fan, or a portable, I should say, axial fan that uh, you commonly see used for uh, confined space entry or other uh, operations where you need uh, temporary ventilation. Uh, and for temporary ventilation, these portable fans work really well. Now, you're not going to see axial fans used very much in permanent ventilation systems, They're, unless it's the, the duct booster fans. The main fan in an industrial, a fixed in place industrial ventilation system is not likely to be an axial fan. It's going to be a centrifugal fan. And this is, this is a diagram or a picture and a diagram showing the fan and the main component of the fan, which is the impellers. This is considered the most efficient fan design, uh, most common in industrial ventilation systems. Uh, these types of fans uh, can handle different sizes of material. This is one of their strengths. They can handle different sizes of contaminant or material that will pass through the impellers from microscopic all the way up to, to visible contaminants, uh, pieces of trash, pieces of paper, uh, chips of wood. These fans are very efficient at moving air and they will, they, they, they're able to, to suck it all in with this type of fan. Now the axial fans also do that, but they're just not as efficient. Uh, the centrifugal fans can also, if they're designed and built well, they can run for years and years. You'll see industrial operations with centrifugal fans that have been in service for 15 or 20 years. And they can, they can, can continue to perform in harsh environments, perform for a long period of time, even in the harshest of environments. Um, yeah. A note again about engineers, there are engineers, I think I said this in the last unit, uh, there are engineers, that's their entire life work is on fan design and they're continually experimenting with different, uh, you know, different shapes to the impellers, different shapes on the blades. Uh, they're looking at all aspects of fan design. Uh, trying to achieve the most efficient design. Efficient means it moves the air, moves the most air at the lowest cost. Um, again, axial centrifugal fans, the two most common types of fans that you're going to see in industrial ventilation with the centrifugal fan being the most common. As far as fan positioning within an industrial ventilation system, generally it's going to be between the hood or the inlets and the exhaust. If air treatment, if an air treatment component is involved, it's normally going to be between the fan and the inlet. So we have the fan here, we have air treatment, and we have the inlets. And again, that's very basic, and that's normally what you're going to see. There, there may be some, some oddball designs out there depending on the, the operation 
where you know it's possible it's possible to have other designs but again it's right off the top of my head I can't think of any uh, examples in service of other designs this is this is going to be typical of 99 percent of the industrial ventilation systems out there when we're talking about the placement of the fan and like I said previously some systems may use duct fans or booster fans duct booster fans to improve airflow for long runs of duct work now let's say this is a hundred foot run here there might be booster fans located every uh, 25 feet within the hundred foot run yeah, another another dimension of ventilation systems that we haven't talked about is a clean out uh, access uh, most good ventilation systems are going to have access to the ductwork for maintenance purposes, for clean-out purposes. Uh, properly functioning systems shouldn't have a lot of residue build up inside the ductwork, but there's possibility for you know, bits of trash or uh, other, other contaminants to end up uh, stuck in the system. You need to be able to get in there and, and, uh, and remove those types of contaminants. Now, you don't have to have a clean-out, though. I mean, the clean-out makes it easier. That's the purpose of a clean-out port. But you can open up your, your ventilation system at any of the branches on the main duct and, and uh, do your clean-out from that position. Uh, one thing that's interesting about this diagram, you, we have our main duct and we have three branches, but one of these branches will have uh, branches off of it. Uh, so it, another, another design feature that we didn't talk about or we haven't talked about, it is possible to design uh, multiple branches uh, off of a branch or other branches off of a branch from the main duct. See, what else can I say here? Uh, now, we'll get into, we'll, we'll talk about the stack and the importance of the exhaust stack uh, in, a, in another video. That's another component that we need to pay attention to. All right, that's it for this video. When we come back, we are going to talk more about the importance of makeup air. We need makeup air so the system doesn't become vapor locked or airbound. Airbound is the better term. All right, I'll see you in the next video.